Welcome to today's presentation, World Class Resources to Discover Genetic Risk for Suicide Death. As we have noted, the work of the Mountain Plains MHTTC and Mountain Plains PTTC is supported by SAMHSA and DHHS. We would like to note that today's presentation is provided free of charge and is available in the public domain. Also, the information presented today are the views and opinions of Dr. Hilary Kuhn and do not reflect the official position of DHHS or SAMHSA. Please let us know if you have any questions about information in this disclaimer. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter today. Dr. Hilary Kuhn received her PhD from the Institute of Behavioral Genetics at the University of Colorado Boulder. She moved to Salt Lake City in 1991 to start work in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Utah on an NIH postdoctoral grant that she received, that, or excuse me, that she was awarded for schizophrenia and bipolar work. She found the University of Utah to be a fantastic place to work and has been there ever since. She is now a tenured professor and her work focuses mainly on the development and applications of methods for gene discovery com for complex disorders, including genetic risk, risk and epidemiology of suicide. This work is made possible through a collection of over 7,000 DNA samples from complicated suicide co suicides collected through a two decade collaboration with the Utah State Office of the Medical Examiner. These cases have been linked to the Utah Population Database, or UPDB, a statewide data resource that includes extensive genealogical records, demographics, environmental data, and current medical data from over 11 million individuals. Dr. Kuhn's group pursues com complementary genome-wide analysis for the discovery of common risk in our large sample and additional characterization of our resources for many psychiatric, medical, and behavioral traits using polygenetic risk scoring. Now I will turn the time over to Dr. Hilary Kuhn. Welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate all the people that have taken time out of their sort of crazy schedules um, in, the, on this, in this unprecedented time to join us for this webinar. And I definitely thank the MHTTC and the PTTC for inviting me to, to present to you. It's a real honor uh, to be able to do this. So first off, I really do wanna make sure that you're aware we're talking about suicide risk today. And, um, and I know that this can be an uncomfortable uh, topic for many people. And if this is at all triggering for you, I would really encourage you to make sure that you, uh, you phone the call line or hit the uh, National Service Prevention website I've included these resources here uh, partly because of um, wanting to make sure that you're, you're aware of them. There are certainly many more local resources that will be in your area. Uh, and if you, you want to reach out and uh, understand some more of these resources, please don't hesitate to do so. My contact information will be at the, um, the end of the, the presentation. So there are also a lot of really interesting research resources. These are uh, um, national resources, also uh, World Health Organization, which I didn't include here, gives you some global uh, research resources. So these are, these are some resources that I've used in, in my own work, and they, they will also give you some information about your regional uh, research um, recent findings. So just to put us all on the same page, uh, I want to give you a little bit of background. Um, as I'm sure all of you are aware, suicide is a major public health crisis now. Uh, right now, it's the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. Um, these are statistics from 2017, so they're a little bit out of date, uh, but close to 50,000 people in the US died by suicide, uh, eight, over 800,000 individuals uh, worldwide. And the, the cause of death, this is a more leading cause of death in our younger population. Um, so this is, this is definitely a, a, a public health crisis. It's also worth saying that um, there are a number of attempts, suicide attempts is 25 to 30 times more common than death by suicide. So over a million, close to a million and a half attempts uh, in the US in 2017. And in spite of the fact that uh, this is a, a major health burden and health crisis, 
The research funding for suicide is somewhat um, less than some of the other uh, national health crises that we're facing. This isn't to diminish in any way the burden of uh, health uh, crises such as cancer. Uh, it's just to say that suicide has been a, a very underfunded area. Um, thankfully, this is starting to change. Uh, suicide research is now a big uh, focus for the National Institutes of Health. And there are other uh, funding, um, private funding uh, foundations that are trying to shore up this this need as well. So the other, the other um, particularly alarming aspect about suicide death is that this is actually an increasing problem. Suicide has increased 33% in the U.S. since 1999, and in Utah, which is sort of, you know, obviously where I live and where I've been thinking about this, this has been particularly dramatic. Uh, suicide has risen 46% in Utah, and this is the increases have been particularly dramatic for uh, for women. So it's important when we're thinking about studying suicide to kind of understand some of the basic epidemiology uh, behind uh, what's going on here. And one fascinating aspect of this is the difference in just very basic epidemiology between those individuals who attempt suicide versus those who actually die by suicide. So again, a suicide attempt is way more common, about 25 to 30 times more common. Um, the, the, uh, the sex ratio for suicide death is, is very male oriented. So it's almost four to one male to female for those who die by suicide. Uh, for attempts, it, these are, of course, a lot more difficult to um, very accurately uh, determine, but attempts are about twice as common in females, especially in youth. So very different, different uh, epidemiology of these phenomena. It's also the case that suicide death is quite familial. Um, this has actually been known for quite a long time. I'm showing you a family diagram so in this diagram, the squares are male and the female, the, the circles are females. And so this, this is showing a genealogy and this is from a study from the 1980s that was done by Janice Eglund in the Old Order Amish, Pennsylvania. She studied a number of families with, at high risk for psychopathology. Um, and what she noticed, even though there were dozens of these families, is that in the the big extended family trees that she studied, only four of them had the aggregation of suicide deaths. So even though a lot of individuals who die by suicide do struggle by, with mental illness, um, it is the case that most of those who have mental illness don't actually die by suicide. And this she saw in her sample, not only among just the cases, but that it aggregated in this very familial way. So this was an early indication that the familial risk of suicide death was potentially independent of psychopathology. And there have been a number of additional studies done by, uh, by researchers in this country and other countries to suggest this same phenomenon, that there really may be independent risk factors that are unique to suicide. Well, so you're aware from the title of my talk that, I, that I'm interested in studying genetics of this, uh, this phenomenon. And I have to, of course, then convince myself that it's truly some, something that has genetic etiology. So the family studies tell us this in some degree, but families also share a lot of environmental exposures and risks. So what we have to do is kind of look at different ways of convincing ourselves that there's a, a genetic uh, contribution to suicide. So what, one way to do this is kind of an, an interesting natural human experiment, which is to look at the comparison of, of um, twins. So we know that identical twins share all of their genetics, while fraternal twins are like full siblings. They share about half their genes on average. So if we look at the difference in the um, concordance between individuals who are identical twins versus those who are fraternal twins, this gives us a suggestion of the degree to which the gen uh, genetic contribution 
underlies any trait, uh, let alone uh, suicide death. So you see here, this is a compendium of twin studies from the worldwide literature looking at the concordance of suicide death among monozygotic twins. Again, these are the identical twins that share all of their genes versus fraternal twins who are the ones that are like full siblings sharing half their genes. And you can see that the concordance is much more uh, uh, apparent in the monozygotic twins where they share all of their genetic material. The other nice thing about this particular design is that the twins are sharing um, sort of equivalent degrees of uh, environmental factors. This would even go back to prenatal risks. So you're, you're controlling a little bit for the, uh, for the environmental risks that are shared. Another interesting uh, design to sort of look at whether or not there might be genetic underpinnings to suicide death is to look at adoption studies. So with an adoption study, we can compare rates of any trait, again, um, among the adopted individual who is uh, not being raised in, in the same family as their biological relatives. So if we look at rates in, a, in the adopting relatives of an individual died by suicide versus the rates of suicide in their biological relatives, this will tell us um, a little bit more, again, about whether or not the genetics are actually uh, contributing to this risk. And what you see is in the biological relatives of individuals who died by suicide, this is four to five times the population rate, which is about the same as what we see in, in the, in the uh, family studies, it's about what we would expect. In the adopting relatives, it's not, not increased at all. Uh, so this again gives us some evidence that there's, there's some genetic predisposition to, um, to suicide risk. And um, we can look at meta-analyses of all of the studies that have been done in the literature and come up with a, with a number that it's about 50% of um, the, the genetic contribution is giving to the risk of suicide death. So it's worth, it's worth noting that Poor suicide is very complex. So we know that mental illness is a, is a factor, um, but we also know that about 90% of individuals with a psychiatric diagnosis don't die by suicide. So it's not deterministic. Uh, we also know that about 50% of individuals who died by suicide had no evidence of a psychiatric diagnosis. Now, this may mean that this is a missed oppor clinical opportunity and they are struggling, um, but it is of interest that, uh, that these risks don't seem to be completely overlapping. There are, of course, also medical risks, including major illness, uh, chronic pain, all kinds of exposures, early life risks, emotional and physical trauma, uh, traumatic violence, drugs, alcohol, toxins. Um, there's social factors, social isolation, poor social supports, uh, bereavement, um, poverty, financial losses. And, you know, we have to say that right now we're living in, in sort of a perfect storm of suicide risk uh, with folks needing to do social isolation, um, potentially experiencing bereavement, uh, experience extreme stress in these um, unprecedented times. And then with a, a, a wave of potential financial stresses uh, and poverty uh, about ready to break over us. So we know that all of these uh, stresses are extremely important. And what we are doing in, in our studies is trying to find the biological risks that may tell us who is actually the most vulnerable to these particular environmental stressors so having a genetic risk factor certainly doesn't guarantee suicide risk. This is sort of like having maybe genetic risk for something like obesity. Uh, we know that some individuals struggle more with weight gain. And this doesn't mean that they necessarily become obese. It simply means that they may have a biological predisposition to struggling with this particular aspect. So this is what we're trying to do in looking for genetic risk factors is to try to, to identify those most at risk. So uh, why Utah? Well, um, we know that there's in this map that you see on this particular slide, there is kind of a, what we might call a suicide belt. Uh, this is the states that look bright red here that um, have high rates of suicide. And this 
particular diagram sort of changes a little bit year to year. Uh, we all get this sort of dubious distinction of being more or less on the top of the, the um, suicide uh, risk rate. Um, but you, you, you do notice that, uh, that this also sort of interestingly maps onto the Intermountain region. Um, I do have a colleague who studies the effects of altitude on suicide risk, and this is a very interesting hypothesis. I won't really get into that because that's a whole different area. It's fascinating. Um, but the idea is that, uh, that individuals who are particularly at risk for, for um, oxygen processing in the brain, this, that this may be a, a, a triggering mechanism. So um, at any rate, Utah is um, certainly in among the highest uh, for suicide death rates uh, in the country. And in Utah, the suicide is the leading cause of death for people under the age 25. And our governor has declared this a, an epidemic. A couple of logistical elements make this really uh, attractive for, um, for research here. Um, one of the, these is that we have a very centralized medical examiner's office. This is a statewide office. So this makes it just more logistically possible for us to get records from individuals who died by suicide and to have um, collection happen for samples for uh, obtaining DNA in, in order to do uh, genetic studies. So this collection was started by a very foresighted co colleague of mine about two decades ago. And we now have around 7,000 uh, DNA from uh, 7,000 individuals who died by suicide. This grows, unfortunately, uh, at the rate of about 700 individuals a year. Again, this is statewide collection. So this is a growing resource. And it's worth saying that uh, most other worldwide studies that, that think about looking at genetic risk for suicide don't really have this resource uh, for suicide, studying suicide death. They're needing to study suicide attempt um, because they just don't have the capacity to collect samples from individuals who have died by suicide. So we have an opportunity to, to contribute to the uh, worldwide knowledge of um, this really serious outcome. So the other thing that I think was mentioned in the introduction that we have here in Utah that's really um, quite amazing is the Utah Population Database. So this is a statewide database. Uh, it includes a lot of stakeholders. Uh, it includes medical records data back to about the year 2000, so a couple of decades of, of medical records data. It includes a lot of demographic information, uh, it includes some exposures, and then very importantly for us, it includes genealogical records. So these are records that go back to the um, 1800s, sometimes even 1700s, that are from the um, LDS Church. These were uh, get donated to the University of Utah for medical research, uh, and they are one of the reasons why the University of Utah has, has been uh, a leader in finding some genetic predispositions for disease, such as the BRCA1 breast cancer gene uh, and other genes. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in, the, in a minute, but it's a unique feature of the Utah Population Database. So why do we need to study suicide death? Um, we're, we're very interested in doing this here and we think it's very important. Um, one, one thing to note is that research has actually gotten quite a lot better at predicting who attempts suicide. So there are uh, models that have been developed now using electronic health records. And these models actually are, are getting better and better at identifying people who attempt. But we know that about 50% of suicide deaths occur without any evidence of prior attempt. And actually, even among those who make attempts, only about 7% of them go on to die by suicide. So our capacity to actually predict who will die by suicide needs some serious improvement. This is uh, something that is very, very difficult. And we could try to focus our effect on our, our efforts on uh, looking at environmental risk factors. These are really difficult. So 
we would need to be able to measure them accurately. We would need to be able to think about timing and intensity of environmental exposures. Uh, and we think that possibly if we start with the genetic side of things, where we're looking at individuals who may be more at risk for exposures, that this will really help us in trying to focus our efforts uh, better in looking at the, what we think is maybe much more complicated uh, side of things in looking at environmental risks. So again, what we have here is a, a resource that's, that's really pretty unprecedented uh, and, and uh, came about through some really foresighted individuals who started this collection. We'll probably have about 10,000 DNAs from individuals who died by suicide by, by the year 2024. And most of these do link to the Utah Population Database, so it allows us some way of characterizing risk factors once we've tried to, to uh, unravel some of the, the uh, genetic underpinnings. So what we have now, uh, we've developed me with a lot of other collaborators. This is absolutely a big effort, um, something that we call the Utah Suicide Genetic Risk Study. And these are our overarching um, aims. We, we want to try to identify some of the risk factors for suicide death. We know these are complicated and there will be many of them. We want to try to use these to characterize genetic risk subgroups. We want to under, understand what are the mechanisms that are implicated by these genetic findings. We importantly, we want to recognize e ELSI is ethical, legal, and social impacts of this. We've already started some ethical studies trying to, um, trying to get uh, in information from individuals who've survived suicide attempts and their family members on how they think about this, um, about us attempting to uh, identify genetic risk factors. So we think this is also important. And I put a bunch of puzzle pieces here, which are um, aspects of risk that are being studied by our group. I'll touch up on a few of these uh, and just know that this is, we recognize this is a really big problem. Um, one of the things that, that we think is maybe the most unique about our resource is the extended genealogical data. And just to give you a little bit more background on that and how we're using it, um, what happens is we get information from the medical examiner's office associated with an individual where we have a sample that we can um, use to extract DNA. This is given to the Utah Population Database and their staff is behind a computer firewall. They link then to genealogical records and health records, and then de-identify that resulting data so that us on the analysis side of things can look at a de-identified data set. And what we're doing with the extended, extended family data is looking at these, um, these very large family clusters. So with these clusters, we, we hope that within the family unit that we may be looking at up there as a somewhat more contained smaller problem where the genetic predisposition within that family may be, may be a little bit more homogeneous, that it's something that's passed down from those ancestors back in the 1800s. And that by looking at the genetics of the individuals who are linked in these big families, we may be able to identify at least within that family um, some genetic uh, causes that are leading to in the increase in risk for suicide. Let me show you uh, what one, one or two of these families look like. So again, this is a diagram of a family. We've disguised uh, uh, the sex of the individuals. We don't really need it at this point. Um, and this just it, uh, protects the privacy of the families. Uh, so these, th these are families that are really, really distantly related. Um, and one aspect of this is that helps us when we're trying to isolate just the genetic risk factors is that most of these individuals really don't share much environment. Um, we've even uh, tried to look at uh, broad um, zip code uh, uh, data and we can show that within these families, people aren't even really living in the same region. So they're really not sharing much in the way of environmental risks. So what they share that's, that's, uh, that has to do with their, the increased risk in these, in these families really has to do more with their, their common genetics. So we've 
taken the individuals in these families and the ones that I've circled in red. So anybody that has that's shaded in in black is a suicide death. And we know these suicide deaths from the medical examiner and actually from death certificates in the Utah population database all the way back to 1904. Um, so we, we look at these suicide deaths. We have the ones that circled in red there. We have their DNA and we look at sharing of genetic genomic regions among these families me members to tell us if they are uh, they are sharing a, a region of the genome that has a gene that then we could say that maybe this is something that is contributing to their increase in suicide risk. Uh, and that was a relatively small family. Here's a, here's a bigger family. Um, these, these families, we have hundreds of them. Um, because we have a very large data resource, thousands of individuals who died by suicide. Uh, we have over 500 families that look significantly high risk for suicide death, um, looking at these genealogical records. And one of the things that we did was pick uh, about 45, of, 43 of these really high risk families and look at their genotyping and look what they shared. And when we did this, we came up with about 30 uh, significant regions from these families where it looks like the individuals within the families are sharing a particular section of DNA. And when we look at the, this, these regions of DNA, we can go one step further and ask ourselves, okay, what are the genes in these regions? And these genes then are targets for us to look at in more detail as being genes that might be implicated uh, in risk of, of increased risk of suicide death. So you might think that 200 genes here is kind of a lot, um, but it's way better than thinking about the, about 18,000 genes across the genome. So one of the things that the, the big families have done is they've allowed us to pare down to a much smaller set of uh, targeted genes to look at for potential, potentially um, important genetic risk factors that increase risk of suicide death. So I have a, a fantastic uh, graduate student who's been working for a couple of years on a follow-up of one particular gene in one of these regions. Uh, this gene is a uh, norexin gene. It's, uh, it's a gene that in, is involved in uh, synapses. So synapses are how the neurons in the brain communicate with each other. Uh, and this particular gene, norexin, is an interesting, it's, it controls synapse organization. And it, it has prior associations, changes in this gene have prior associations with psychopathology, including schizophrenia and autism uh, and bipolar disorder. So what she did was look a lot at our data and find two specific norexin genetic variants that showed some statistical association then with suicide death above and beyond the familial association that led her to this gene in the first place. And then she spent quite a bit of time looking at um, bench on the bench uh, in, in, uh, in a dish, looking at how these particular changes in norexin could alter um, the, the aspects of synaptic binding. And what she found was that the variants showed some increase in binding, uh, in postsynaptic binding. So this just means that these particular variants, when compared to the, the gene without any variants in it at all, so these particular variant changes in the gene, they increase the synapse binding uh, and above and beyond what we would expect. So there is some indication that these variants that she found might change the way that uh, synapses are talking to each other uh, in individuals who died by suicide. So this is, this is work that needs to be replicated. It's some initial findings. And I should note that these, these variants are really rare. They're not, this is not explaining every single suicide death in our sample. This is about 1% of our cases um, that might have one of the, one or the other of these variants. So this is, this is again, an uh, indication that this is a very complex problem. And even once we might land on a gene that looks like it might be implicated in risk, 
the changes in that gene are going to be hard to find, and um, studying them is it's going to be a long road. So uh, change directions a little bit. This is another strategy that our group is using. This is um, something called genome-wide association study. And what we do here is, uh, is independent of our, our, in our high-risk family study. So this is just taking all of our suicide deaths and looking at every location we have genotype information in across the genome and looking at the frequencies in the changes uh, in those those locations across the genome compared with really large uh, publicly available data from, um, from control populations. So this is uh, the UK Biobank and um, another uh, uh, UK sample. And what we can see is that there are some locations in the genome where it looks like our suicide sample has a definitely a different um, a different frequencies uh, in these locations in the genome. And again, this is kind of like the family study where this particular study design tells us some locations in the genome that really might be implicated in risk. We can also look at those about 18,000 genes across the genome uh, using this much broader, uh, more complete um, genotyping in all of our, our cases. Uh, against these, again, these publicly available controls and just look at all the, the genes across the genome and we find uh, additional about 10 genes that look like they might be implicated in this, in this particular non-familial study design. So overall, these uh, genome-wide studies gave us um, some uh, 21 genes that looked like they had um, some evidence that they might be implicated in suicide risk and we don't know exactly what the changes in these genes might be. Um, this is going to uh, involve additional study, kind of like what we did with the norexin gene in the family-based studies. So um, one of the other things we can do here is also look at how do these genes sort of group together in, with, in regards to what are they doing in the body? So we can, these are called functional pathways. So we noticed that these genes are preferentially involved in neuronal development. Some of them are involved, interestingly, in metabolic function. We did actually find that also in our uh, family-based analyses. And this might go back to the observation of my colleague that has to do with oxygen processing as being a, a trigger for some particular individuals who are at, at genetic risk, at specific genetic risk. Um, we also find that these genes look like they have prior uh, evidence in schizophrenia, in Alzheimer's disease, and in bipolar disease. So, um, and also then uh, have differential brain expression in uh, some psychopathology, psychopathology, schizophrenia, autism, bipolar. So these, these findings are showing us that uh, we're, we're starting to get um, a group of genes that look like they may be uh, implicated in risk. And again, we really think that um, this is a very complex problem and that there are probably hundreds of genes. But if we can start trying to define some of the genes that are uh, implicated in risk and finding some of the, the actual changes in those genes, what are they doing, that it will be able to help us identify individuals that are, um, are much higher risk than other individuals. One of the other things that we can do with the, the genome-wide uh, data, the association data in our bigger sample is look at something called polygenic risk scores. So a polygenic risk score is a quantitative score that reflects a, sort of the background genetics of a trait. And what we can do is we can take um, genome-wide uh, results from some external studies of other traits that we know might be implicated in suicide risk, for example, major depression, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and we can apply those results from the, those external published studies to our data and, um, and look at then the, the summed score across the genome for these other traits. So 
Um, this score really gives us more of sort of a potential sort of background uh, polygenic risk of some associated psychopathology or behavioral trait. And there are hundreds of these uh, polygenic risks that now can be computed from really, really large, very well-powered uh, published studies. So just to get, just to show you what a few of these look like, um, pretty, pretty much ex what we would expect for a lot of these background effects in our suicide uh, data and our suicide resource. So uh, we see elevation for depressive symptoms and, and major depressive disorder. For traits like neuroticism, loneliness, um, we see an increase in, in uh, uh, for other psychopathology, including autism, ADHD, uh, and um, this is compared to two different uh, comparison samples. I don't know exactly what's going on with subjective well-being. <laughs> differences, maybe slight differences in the way that the the data are being processed or collected. Uh, I'm actually of Scottish background, so I just love it that subjective well-being looks really high for Generation Scotland. Um, that's awesome. Maybe that gives me some protective factors. So the family studies and the uh, genome-wide association studies gave us sort of a, a good um, handle on what genes could we target. But again, it took a lot of work to go the next step in the Nurexin studies that we did from the family-based family, family -based analyses. We'd be faced with that with the, the genes from our genome-wide association study too. We have, to, we have to really look for exact variants that might be implicated and do a lot more work to, uh, to understand what's going on with specific variants. So one thing we decided to do with a really talented uh, postdoc in our group was to use the genome-wide genotyping uh, has some variants in it that actually do um, affect gene function. Most of the variants in these genome-wide studies don't do that. So um, they are trying to look, they're trying to give you a lot of information about variability among populations. And so they're mainly looking at genomic variation that isn't inside genes, that's in the, the spaces in between genes in our genome, the sort of junk DNA that we, that we call it now, although it may not be junk at all, um, that has a lot of variability. Uh, within genes, there isn't a lot of variability. As you might imagine, um, if you had variability there, it, it, it's often damaging. So the, the genome-wide uh, genotyping doesn't include a lot of vari variants that really affect gene function, but it does include some. And so we, what we thought is, gee, you know, why don't we take advantage of this and look at the variants that are in this genome-wide genotyping that actually do something to genes and do an association study on just those really functional uh, genotypes. So to do this, we kept about 40,000 variants. So you might think, oh, wow, 40,000, that's a lot. Um, but actually that's a tiny fraction of the genome. The genome has 3 billion uh, base pairs in it. So 40,000 is about 0.001% of that. Um, it's not a lot. So obviously this isn't inclusive of every variant that's out there. But it's a nice efficient way to look at uh, genomic variants that might actually do something and bypass that step uh, that we need to then pursue in, in the other study designs. So we compared these potentially functional variants between our suicides and again, the publicly available uh, resources that controls can match for ancestry. And we came up with five variants that looked really interesting. Um, these are variants, again, that this isn't just a gene that we're looking at now. We were looking at a gene change that likely does something in this, in this particular gene. So the, the genes uh, that were involved here really are interesting. Several of them have uh, supporting postmortem evidence from other studies, looking like they have, they're implicated in suicide death. Also implicating, also uh, supporting studies that show associations with bipolar disorder, with schizophrenia. Um, some in, uh, evidence is really interesting, uh, implicating immune system dysfunction, circadian rhythm, uh, and then also signal transduction. So these genes, uh, these variants are actually of immediate uh, interest to us, looking at exactly what do they do. 
uh, pursuing some uh, studies at the bench, looking at these, and also the genes. Do they have other variants that are involved in risk? The gene pathways that are implicated by these genes, what are they doing? So it's opened some other doors for us. We're also looking with some of our colleagues in human genetics at another way of looking at uh, a DNA, which is little uh, chunks of DNA that are deleted or duplicated in our genome. These are called structural variants. And sometimes structural variants can have a dramatic effect on genes. So it's worth looking at these. They tend to be rare. I'm showing you a picture of um, a visualization tool, this fantastic visualization tool that's developed by the, my colleagues in human genetics, where you can actually see the deletion in the genome uh, in this particular location. This, um, this happens to overlap with the gene RGL3, which is a neuronal differentiation gene. It's, um, it's only in nine of our cases, right? So this is this is a small set of individuals who died by suicide because this comes from whole genome sequencing data and it's expensive to generate. So we only have 281 individuals with this whole genome sequencing data. Uh, so about 3% of them have this particular deletion. This isn't, uh, it's, it's rare in comparison data, but it's not completely absent. So. Uh, again, this isn't something that if you had this deletion, you're absolutely known. It's absolutely known that you would die by suicide. This is going to be a risk factor. Uh, but it's, it's worth looking at these particular types of um, genetic events as another way of, of giving us some clues about what genes are involved. So we did this with, uh, with this rather small set of uh, whole genome data, and we have looked at uh, what are the, the deletions and duplications, what, what kinds of genes do they, um, they implicate, and we're finding these uh, preferentially in genes that have to do with neuronal function. Uh, interestingly, there's some overlap with the genes and gene pathways that we found in our association studies. So um, we find that really fascinating. We've got a lot of work to do with these. Um, we're trying to figure out, do they overlap with the, the parts of genes that actually are, are um, functioning and uh, affecting how the gene works? Uh, and we're also looking at a much bigger um, data set of uh, sequencing data. We've got about 400 more cases that are in progress. Uh, these are really prioritized as being cases that look like they have more familial risk, so they should be ones that have higher degree of genetic risk. And then another interesting thing to note is that um, we are working with individuals in the international community who are really focused on suicide risk. So there is a, a large consortium group that's part of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium that's now very interested in studying uh, genetic risk of suicide. Uh, you can see this slide here has uh, individuals from, or uh, studies from across the country. Uh, this is also worldwide. The ISYC is a big consortium that is European. DECODE is Iceland. Um, and we now are, are looking at, I think it's more like upwards of 30,000 cases. This slide's a little out of date. Um, a couple hundred thousand uh, comparison individuals where it's actually uh, documented that there's no attempt. Uh, it's worth saying that Utah really has the only big data set here that, um, is, again, that's this looking at suicide death. So all of these are really more um, looking at suicide attempt, but then Looking at the genetics of suicide attempt and comparing it with suicide death is going to be very, very, very important for us. Okay, so just to summarize a little bit, uh, we've got genome-wide association studies, we've got family studies, uh, we're looking at different ways of characterizing uh, uh, genetic changes, including structural variants. We are, um, some of these pictures here are looking at postmortem brain tissue. We have a very small collection of that, but we're hopefully partnering with the uh, NIH uh, neurobiobanks to ramp up that, that collection so that we can look at actual changes 
in postmortem brain uh, tissue of individuals who died by suicide. Looking at exposures, we're looking at exposure to air, uh, short term exposure to uh, air pollution. This kind of matches again with the altitude hypothesis is this um, oxygen processing, metabolic processes, inflammation, immune function. We have a lot of uh, studies that are um, just starting out um, in progress. I told you a little bit about the fact that we're, we're working on new whole genome data. We're looking at epigenetic studies, which is a different way of, of thinking about genetic changes. We have some uh, new studies where we're trying to link to physician notes in the medical records. This would give us a much more accurate picture of suicide attempt, uh, both within our, our um, individuals who died by suicide and then also to compare in the control individuals. We have uh, one researcher in our group that's looking at the overlap between suicide risk and the opioid epidemic. Uh, we're looking at toxicology and hair samples collected from individuals who died by suicide. These would be um, both uh, um, uh, pharm pharmacological exposures, uh, air pollution exposure, other toxic environmental exposures that you can measure in, um, in mass spec analyses of hair. Uh, we're trying to make sure that we really pay attention to our ethics studies. We're, um, we're planning interviews of new survival, survivor groups. So these would be individuals in rural communities, uh, looking at minorities and refugees. We're also um, interested in getting uh, in opinions about our research in among providers. And we have our, our local and regional and international collaborations. We're hoping that this, um, this work really uh, continues to grow and that we continue to make good discoveries um, uh, on genetic risks of suicide. So just a reminder, this is super complex, right? There are likely hundreds of genetic variants leading to suicide risk. And we're seriously in this probabilistic universe, right? No individual uh, variant is determining suicide death. These, those, their uh, risk factors are going to just be identifying individuals who are more susceptible potentially to environmental risk factors. And just to, to end here, uh, there's a lot of collaborators. Um, my goal is actually to make this slide have so many people on this slide that uh, you can't read it. Um, we have fantastic collaborators in our department, across departments at this university, uh, across institutions, um, so Intermountain Health, and then also the um, Utah Health Department. Uh, we have uh, collaborators uh, who are external, who are advisors um, and institutions across the country. We have a partnership with Janssen Research uh, who provided some of the funding for genotyping and uh, sequencing data in this project. We have support from the NIH, from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, from several foundations. Uh, we have some new support from the Huntsman Mental Health Institute here um, to look at the new sequencing data. And it really takes a village. Um, we so appreciate our collaborators and our funders. And again, I want to make sure that you're aware of resources. There are many resources that are um, available for thinking about uh, research, but then also these prevention and health uh, crisis services. And I want to make sure that that is available to you. And thank you. I've provided my contact information and I'm absolutely delighted to hear from anybody who might want to contact me. I love geeking out about this stuff and uh, speaking with people about their thoughts about the work. Thanks. Hillary, thank you so much for your awesome presentation and for all the research that you're doing right now. We're going to find out more and more as, as time goes on. So thank you.